Welcome to Magical Women. I'm your host, Connie Boyd, and this is our third sequel talk with the amazing Gay Blackstone. Gay, what would you say is your most magical memory performing with Harry? The most magical moment, that was it, probably with Harry, was opening night on Broadway. And for people who don't know, the floating light bulb had been something that was originally created by his father in the mid 20s. And it went from a floating glass of milk to a floating light bulb. But his father, and had it float across stages. And he went out in the audience and had it float between people's hands. But that was it. With Harry, he created almost as a fluke one night, but we then perfected it. So that at a certain point in the performance, he would point to someone in the audience and say, oh, you'd like to see it also. And the light bulb would soar out to the person in the audience. It would then float across the audience and then it would float back to him on stage, therefore breaking the fourth wall. And if, and if people don't know what the fourth wall is, when you leave the stage, the proscenium, the arch of that, and go into the audience, that's called breaking the fourth wall. And uh, it's because of that that I've also been able to get an intellectual property on the floating light bulb. But anyway, so it would do that, he would then put it back in the, in, in the bulb that I was carrying, turn it on, off, and put the, cap, the uh, globe back on it, would take the bow. Well, on, on the opening night on Broadway, the applause started when it was out in the audience. It continued as it floated back to Harry on stage, as he put it in, as we then took the bow, and it continued for two and a half minutes. Uh, Broadway audiences, especially on opening nights, are also a very sophisticated audience. They have seen it all. They have, they have seen the multi-million dollar things that are going on. And here you have a light bulb. Those are moments that I will never forget because it was the standing ovation. It was the applause. It was something so tiny that made such an impact. Yeah, and a your highlight that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Yes, and we used to kid and say, when, when you're doing a show like a grand show, you have all the promotion that's in advance. So beforehand, people would talk about uh, the elephant. I was going to say, talk elephant about, in the room. <laughs> yes, yes, because we had an elephant in the show. And so they'd talk, they'd talk about the elephant. They would talk about the camel. They would talk about the elaborate sets and the costumes and the props. And they would talk about this Chinese number. They would talk about all these huge things. But after the show, the reviewers would talk about the floating light bulb, the dancing hanky, the vanishing bird cage, and a, a segment that Harry did that we called the committee which was a group of men from the audience that would come up and while he was actually doing the Keller rope tie for our magic friends, uh, he was also doing comedy and pickpocketing. Yeah. That's what they would talk about. Yeah. All the things which quite frankly could be carried in an attache case. Classic, beautiful pieces of magic to this Absolutely. day. Absolutely, yes. And so it was at that point where we had, you know, two 53 foot trucks we had all the animals. We also had rabbits and doves. And uh, we had a hawk that wore a hairpiece to look like an eagle because eagles were endangered species. So, you know, it, it had to have a hair hairpiece so it would look like the eagle. So, I mean, we carried all these right. elaborate pieces with us. And, the, and they, were the, they were the discussion before the show, right. but not afterwards. They were the hook. They were the hook to get people in, and then the actual magic was the simplistic, beautiful, well thought out pieces of art. Yes, and uh, so I mean, it was it was very different uh, than most of what they're doing today. Yeah. Um, many people are only doing close up magic today, which is a beautiful art form. It's not my favorite because illusions are my favorite 
because they're like the opera of the variety world. They take music, they take sets, they take staging, they yeah. take performance, they take all of these things to, to give you a focus. So as much as I appreciate close up, my favorite are the illusions. Uh, there are people that have had success in individuals, as you most certainly know. For any magicians that are out there now and are looking for suggestions from you, my personal suggestion would be to learn close up stage and illusions and have experience in all of them because then that makes you a triple threat. Exactly. First of all, you always need close up things when you're doing press and television. So, because rarely can you bring them in, into a theater. When you're doing something, for a television segment for a promotion, and you're doing it right there in front of their eyes, it's always much stronger. So yes, today's well-rounded performers need to know the close-up, they need to know the illusions, they need to know the stage, they need to be able to tell a story, whether the storytelling is verbal or non-verbal. There, there still needs to be that thread, and whether it's the entire show, or whether it's an act, they, they're still involved in stories. Okay. Speaking of scripts, I wanted to go back to your um, live productions. and um, You're basically scripting a live production and adapting it every time to different artists and different entertainers. And, and how do you script it? Do you have a formula or do you just assess which talent you booked and then you try to balance it? Because that's, that's very difficult, scripting a show. <laughs> And may I tell you, sometimes the first time doing it, you don't get it right, but you have tomorrow. Right. So you, you tweak and you change. I do a rundown, I do a show flow, a rundown. Um, sometimes I change it during rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't get changed for much of the entire tour. Sometimes I change it every night mm -hmm. um, because the way we work, with the performers, we, I tend to have them uh, in two acts. I tend to have them appear once in each act and then all the performers come together and do an illusion that works at the end. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, that equalizes them for the bows at the end is all being the stars. Yes. You know. But you also learn that comedy, next to saying it's closing, is very strong. So comedy magic can go, sometimes you have to move that one more up if you have an illusion that has to be in there because the illusion is so large. So those are kind of two that can rotate depending upon what your stage space is, whether someone is able to work in one while you preset for the finale. I mean, there's so many more things in a show that go into putting it together versus just the performances because there's a performance in front of the curtain and there are performances behind the curtain. But there is frequently as much choreography, not on a five, six, seven, eight, but close to it, behind the levels of curtains. Right. <clears throat> because what your crew and your local crew, that's never seen this before. One of the things that I learned very early on is that it's mandatory to include in the contract that whoever is doing your setup and rehearsal stays and works the show. Yes. It's critical that they know what the pieces are, right. the order they need to be lined up in, what goes, what goes behind the mid stage, what goes in front of the mid stage while something else is being set up behind the mid stage, whether it's in its full curtain and your star drop, which is the curtain with all the little lights and all the various things you can do. If it's your back wall, if you've got a crossover, if you don't have a crossover, you know, all these things which are different in every theater. So and that's what, as a director and a producer, those are the things that you're aware of that even sometimes entertainers aren't aware of what's happening behind during their set. And in many cases, the producer and director and stage managers, they're the unsung heroes because they're troubleshooting. They're the ones actually making sure that the show runs flawlessly so the artists and the magicians can actually relax and perform and not be worried that things are coming out backwards or in the wrong order. So it's a huge responsibility. People have no idea of the amount of pressure and, and uh, just experience it require, it's required to do what you're doing. Oh, yes. Gabe, what changes have you seen with television over time? In the 90s, you had 
you had five choices. Yeah. So the numbers tended to be for the overnights for a show, they could be extremely high. Now, for every hour, if you do not have extended cable and things, you only have 2,500 choices. Otherwise, you can have 5,000 choices per hour. And so if you're getting a 0.2, you're a huge success. Where previously a 0.2 in the 90s would have been like, mm, well, it was nice seeing you, we, you know. You mentioned to me uh, previously in the first half hour, how many viewers you had? Uh, we had a 0.2, which means that's about 784 million. Viewers in the first half hour viewers. of the last special. Yes. Congratulations. Now, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Come on, you can do it. We need subscribers to obtain more privileges with YouTube. So please, please hit that notifications bell. Spread the word and comment. We love to hear from you.